Hello everyone, welcome back. Welcome to this afternoon's session on the pleasure, on pleasure in literary correspondence and collaboration. Our first speaker this afternoon is Hilary J. Beattie. Hilary is a clinical psychologist and psychoanalyst in private practice in New York. She's also on the faculty of the Columbia University Department of Psychiatry. In a previous life, she taught Chinese history at Yale and her love of Stevenson probably goes back to many summers with her father's family in Edinburgh. Hilary's speaking to us today on the pleasures and the perils of collaboration. Stevenson, Bell Strong, and Graham Balfour in Samoa and beyond. Thank you. Several years ago, in the National Library of Scotland, can you hear me? Yes. Down? Yeah, I think Okay. Several years ago, in the National Library of Scotland, I came across a poem that Stevenson wrote to his stepdaughter, Isabel Strong, in fervent appreciation of their improved relationship. Bell, much later, copied and sent it to Graham Balfour, saying it was the dearest treasure of her heart and too intimate to be printed. The original, which she preserved separately from her other Stevensonia, never showed to others may be lost, and the copy is tucked away among unrelated material in the Balfour papers. I used to think it must have been found and published somewhere, but apparently not. Um, I'm sure that Ernest Mehu saw it, but he apparently chose to respect Bell's wishes or maybe Stevenson's reputation. But it is relevant to our conference theme because I believe that the support and pleasure that Lewis derived from his uh, working relationship with Bell once his bête noire helped him not only cope with the difficult final years in Samoa, but also to break new ground in his depiction of women, especially in Weir of Hermiston. The poem consists of 55 lines, all but the last few of which are in a uh, five-line stanza <coughs> called an envelope quintet, which Richard Dury once kindly identified for me. And I won't read all of it because it's just too long and that is somewhat repetitive, but I'll read a, a few verses. We two have known each other so long and have been such very dreadful friends and good that at the end of ends, by way of epilogue and amends, I ought to write you one small song. By way of epilogue and amends from the living hate of long ago, wherein we were tumbled to and fro, nor knew if we were friend or foe. I would thank you that we now are friends. And then, slightly later, we were both so foolish and both so young, both so blind in the third old time, that it blind with a blindness hard as crime, that it seemed we were certainly doomed to climb the ladder of hatred rung by rung. Rung by rung we seemed fated to climb, but no, and rather by little and more, to repent, recomfort, and to restore. And even so, love kept open the door in the worst of the old blind time. And then at the very end, he says, and still remember when his iron ways and fretful petulances graze your lighter, brighter heart, that he sat in the night when he could hardly see, and the rain deafened him and wrote for you these verses not to praise, though praise he might, but with exulting throat to thank the gods that guided us, you and he, through hate and love by land and sea, in calm and blast, to this kind resting place at last. Bell at the end notes that the original was written when we were living in the workman's cottage shortly before you, that is Graham, arrived in Samoa, which was on August 6, 1892. Now, there's a lot of background to this. Why did they hate each other so much and then turn it around? Um, and I don't really have time to do more than summarize briefly. Um, basically, I think Bell resented the high-handed way that Lewis disrupted and reorganized other people's lives for his own pleasure and convenience as she saw it, starting with his engineering her parents' divorce in 1879. Of course, Belle adored her father and vice versa. And then she resented later how Lewis tried to plan her own life. Um, 
in the 1880s, she and her husband, the artist Rose, Joe Strong, were living the high life in Hawaii. Um, and, uh, but when Lewis and Fanny arrived in 1889, they put a stop to it all. Joe was a talented artist, but a problem drinker who didn't pay his bills. Uh, Lewis, however, was invested in seeing him as a lovable fellow, and he, abs in every letter about him, he completely ignores Joe's drinking, which uh, everybody else comments on. Um, but he applied that Bell was the irresponsible, pleasure-loving spendthrift. Bell, her son Austin, and later on Joe were dumped in Sydney, where in 1890 Lewis and Fanny met up with them again. Um, Lewis did begin to think less, less harshly of Bell, who had done well by Joe in the finances. So when he realized that his health would require him to spend the rest of his life in Samoa, he expected Bell and Joe to fall in with his plan to have all his family live with him there. Bell claims in her memoir that she made one last stand against this latest attempt to plan her life, but in the end capitulated to Lewis's fervent persuasion. She did love to please and to be needed, and so she finally, she says, accepted her new role as Lewis's loving daughter. By May 1891, when the Strongs arrived in Samoa to live in the original workman's cottage, which was now rebuilt near the new house, there were signs of strain. Fanny was loyally working the land to support them, but was deeply hurt by Lewis's tactlessly belittling her own literary aspirations, telling her she was no artist but had the soul of a born natural peasant. Worn out by dealing with European and local help, Fanny complained repeatedly of feeling ill until Lewis sent her off to Fiji that August for a rest and a change. There she hired an Indian cook since she distrusted Samoans as servants. But on returning in September, she found that Lloyd and Bell, who was an expert cook, um, had got rid of the European staff and had taken over the cooking himself, which Lewis said was a vast improvement and a huge economy. They were also training a young Samoan to be their cook. So Fanny was proved wrong and had to find a new employer for her fine new cook. This domestic coup was a sure sign of Fanny is becoming less central in about Lewis's life. Um, her role as literary collaborator had long since been assumed by Lloyd. Bell was now in charge of domestic affairs, while Fanny, outside, tried frantically to create a cacao plantation. One straw in the wind of many that I could enumerate was when in May 1892, on a visit to Mata'afa, one of the two rival Samoan kings, she and Belle were taken to be Lewis's two wives and were served kava together so they wouldn't be jealous of each other. And I wonder if maybe the canny Samoans picked up on things that the Europeans would or could not. Belle was short and dark like her mother. She was only eight years younger than Lewis and she was now approaching Fanny's age when she and Lewis had met. And she had a son who was close to Lloyd's age then. Later that month, Lewis admitted he was worried about Fanny, who kept miserably ailing, but he says, and if I quote him, it's always from a letter to somebody or other, uh, um, uh, she, he said, she gives herself no chance being always out fighting in her garden. And yet, he says, I can't think what is wrong with her. Lewis could be quite obtuse about other people's feelings where his own interests were concerned, leaving Fanny to vent her rage on the tropical vegetation. Events now moved fast. Lewis's persistent writer's cramp by June that year, 1892, was so bad that Bell offered to help by taking letters to dictation, which he found to be a great invention and one he proposed to stick to. That day, June 21st, 1892, was the last entry Fanny made in her diary for another, for another year, aside from one in December, summarizing the disasters of June and July. 
Joe Strong had never been a happy camper at Vilema, but in late June, his various misdeeds, which included theft and uh, keeping a Samoan mistress, roused Lewis to such a rage that in one week, in early July, he had them divorced and himself made guardian of Austin. Now Belle was the injured innocent and Joe was the unmanly hound, the licentious and ungrateful polecat. Joe was banished from the, the estate. Belle somehow coped, but Fanny, ever the extremist, breathed flames and fury. Thus, the stage was set for Graham's arrival on August 6th. But before that, Lewis gave up his room in the main house for Graham's use, and he moved into the workman's cottage with Belle and Austin, where he remained basically for the rest of the year. So, this is the place and this was the tense uh, atmosphere in which Lewis's fervent poem to Bell was written. Now, I'm not suggesting that there was ever anything overtly sexual between them, but it does sound like greater emotional intimacy, especially on Lewis's part. In any case, as Lewis joked, Bell was well guarded by her aggressive parrot, which he once hurled off the veranda after it, quote, buried its beak in his backside. And then, when Graham did arrive, Belle soon in fell in love with him. He was her own age, tall and good-looking, and perhaps reminded her of her banished father, whose death she had never accepted. Graham, however, resisted her charms, though Fanny clearly would have liked to marry Belle off again. Who knows what Graham really thought at finding himself in this quote, hell of the South Seas, as Lewis liked to call it, but it must have taken all his tact and diplomacy to survive. That September, Lewis sent young Austin away to school in California, which deeply upset Bell, but made her more available as, her in, as his amanuensis, taking letters to dictation so he could save his right hand for fiction. Fanny, meanwhile, was said to be not at all well, but she continued, Lewis said, hulking about in her garden and had reached a sort of tragic placidity. Lewis just kept on writing, and in late October he started to plan a major new novel, possibly to be titled Weir of Hermiston. But early in 1893 he also began a new story, St. Ives, a more commercial venture, and this he decided finally to write to Bell's dictation. And he said, the relief is beyond description. It is just like a school treat to me, and the amanuensis bears up extraordinary. She has her head quite turned and believes herself to be the author of it. Bell recorded it as one of the most delightful days of my life when she took dictation for about, I don't know, it's like about 10 hours. Um, Lewis was so pleased that he had once decide, uh, decided to design a special commemorative ring to give her. And possibly all this pleasure was too intense because the next day he had a hemorrhage and was forbidden to speak, but was able to dictate several pages in the deaf and dumb alphabet which Bell enterprisingly taught him. Early in 1893, um, Lewis wrote some beautiful poems, he called them, about his family. And here we see him starting to merge the persona of Belle with that of her mother. In Mother and Daughter, he addresses them as, my pair of fairies, plump and dark, the dryads of my cattle park. And though he does briefly differentiate them, uh, he rather condescendingly concludes that they are twin honors to my country seat and its too happy master lent my solace and its ornament. The next poem, The Daughter, is by far the longest of the collection. He enumerates her functions, um, which include commanding her huge half-naked staff who obsequiously obey her. Then he celebrates Belle in her newest role, where she plies for me the unresting pen, and while her crimson blood peeps out, hints a suggestion, halts a doubt, laughs at a jest, or with a shy glance of a party-colored eye, approves, delights, and warms the slave for whom she writes. But what a contrast with the next poem, um, short and untitled, about the unnamed person who superintends my harvests and my cattle. 
and I quote, but she, deaf, blind, and prone on face and knee, forgets time, family, and feast, and digs like a demented beast. <laughs> what was he thinking, writing this way about a wife with a hair-trigger sensitivity to slights after so affectionately praising her own daughter? The following February, 1893, Lewis took his two women folk on a vacation trip to Sydney so they could all see doctors. And while there, he had the bright idea, perhaps instead of just giving Belle a ring, of having three rings made, set with topaz, his birthstone, there engraved with his initials and his with the first letters of their names. But his accompanying verses again merged them equally in his affections. These rings are my beloved pair for me on your brown fingers wear, each a perpetual caress to, to tell you of my tenderness. Whatever the intention, they returned home from their amusing but tragic holiday in disarray and with Fanny quite sick. By early April, even the ever hopeful Lewis had to confess to Colvin that all disguise had failed. Fanny is not well and we are miserably anxious. Um, this had been going on for about 18 months. Um, and in fact, though he doesn't say so, this is when Fanny returned from her trip to Fiji to find the household taken over by her children. Um, at first, Lewis had thought Fanny was angry at him, making life so miserable that he had to live in isolation in his own room. But then Joe became a problem and Belle began to make herself my help, helper to my unspeakable comfort. It was a wretched period which culminated in a hell of a scene that lasted all night, and he and Belle had to hold Fanny down for about two hours to prevent her running away. So, what was Fanny's mysterious mental illness? Um, years ago, again, I came across a letter in the Balfour collection, which Fanny wrote in 1901 to Rhoda Balfour, Graham's wife, and a few lines leaped out at me. She says, apologizing for her slowness to reply, I have been in such wretched health with lots of little cocking cares that I must hug to my breast like the Spartan boy. And mm. I am no Spartan, really, at all. I like to shriek and wail and receive sympathy. And, oh, well, I'll leave a little bit out. So these sentiments apply to the whole of Fanny's life. Um, when her passions had a ready outlet, they could devastate others, but not so much herself. Henley and Catherine de Mattel, she could slay and discard, but she was stuck with Lewis and Bell's growing intimacy at Vilema. I'll spare you my diagnostic speculations, except to say that the histrionic Fanny was a somatizer whose fixation on her physical states must have been related to under underlying emotional conflicts. I should also add that these Victorians were probably overstimulated by living in a society that was used to a lot of nudity in both sexes and which was most, much more open and relaxed about sexuality. Uh, Lewis celebrated Bell's controlling her huge half-naked male staff who look splendid in the family pictures, whom you've probably all seen, and all his women folk, especially his mother, recorded appreciative comments about Samoan men's bodies, polished and gleaming with oil. Sigmund Freud, who in these exact same years was writing up studies on hysteria, would have had a field day in Samoa, and those sorts of things did not happen only in Vienna. So, how did they cope with all these tensions? Family. Fanny may have sublib subliminally intuited that all her outbursts merely brought Lewis and uh, uh, Bell closer. And in 1893, she found a providential outlet for her anger and need for self-importance in the war that erupted between the Samoan king Maliatoa and his rival. Um, one way that Lewis coped was apparently through heavy self-medication with alcohol, cigarettes, and black coffee. He made attempts in 1893 to quit the first two, possibly on doctor's orders, he doesn't say, um, but always failed because of miserable withdrawal symptoms. A, a, a more enjoyable tension reliever may have been 
dancing, which Bell was expert at, and one visitor in 1894 described Bell and Lewis dancing together on the polished floor with a vigor seldom matched and a delight splendid to see. Um, Bell herself must have been a real, a great uh, emotional support to him. She was intensely maternal and protective and surrounded Lewis with many little comforts. Runs me like a baby in a perambulator, sees I'm properly dressed, takes care of me when I'm sick, and I don't know what the devil she doesn't do for me when I'm well, from writing my books to trimming my nails. Most importantly, Lewis and Bell developed a dependable rhythm of working together. They were a good team, um, and he paid her for her work and had the amounts properly invested. In February 1894, he finally started dictating Weir of Hermiston to her, and by late March, they had about 50 pages done. Now, 1894 was a difficult year when his letters evidenced si uh, signs of serious depression, even openly wishing that he could just die and be done with it. He kept getting stuck with St. Ives, but Bell recorded that when he picked up Weir again, he was at once in better spirits. He never falters for a word, giving me the sentences as clearly and steadily as though he were reading from an unseen book. His voice is so beautiful and the story so interesting that I forget to rest. It is all the more thrilling as he says he has taken me for the young Kirsty. And by the end of November, they were, she says, pegging away at Hermiston like one o'clock. I hardly drew breath but flew over the paper. Lewis thinks it's good himself, so we were in very cheer cheerful hum humor. Now I have just one page left. Um, I suggested at this, the first time I gave a paper to this assembly uh, that the essential themes of the 1885 story Olalla, um, especially the struggle between an older and a young, younger woman over the same young man, were also present much later in Weir except that there the rival is much more realistically and convincingly portrayed. I think that in some of the old childhood template of Lewis being cared for by two powerful rival women was reenacted with Fanny and Belle, except that now he could develop a close friendship with a sensuous younger woman without actually crossing the sexual boundary so that passion could be safely explored both in fantasy and in fiction. Both the elder and the younger Kirsty display some attributes of Belle, but it's the younger who looks as black's your hat and has an eye as great as a stag. Blackness was for Lewis always associated with Belle, like her huge eyes, and he liked to play up the local rumor that he was, she was his daughter by a black Moroccan woman. There's another little note to Belle that Ernest Mihu did not print in the letters, that he want, Lewis once put into his pillow when she was away from his room. I am going to sleep, my dear, and some apology was needful in the presence of youth, beauty, fatness, and blackness. But if you choose to breed, brood like an angel over my slumbers, no offense will be taken. To conclude, final paragraph, Lewis did create huge problems for himself by insisting on having his family with him at Vilema, but there were compensations, especially the deep pleasure of the working relationship he and Belle created together. And this perhaps did find him, help him find his creative groove again. The irony of it is, however, that I think it's just possible that the sheer sudden pleasure and excitement of writing Weir might have been a factor in his death. The morning of his last day, he and Belle worked steadily on it until noon, and then he walked up and down, she says, talking to me of his work, future chapters, bits of his past life that bore on what he'd been writing, as only he could talk. Lewis had high blood pressure and was a heavy user uh, of alcohol, cigarettes, and coffee. I mean, he was a chain smoker for years. And any one of these, especially smoking, is a major risk factor in hypertension and for stroke. Um, but all three together, in a frail man with his health history, in essence made him a ticking time bomb that might explode at any time of undue stress, pleasurable or not. I mean, there's no way to know 
but in, perhaps for him the timing was good because he may have died a happy man. Okay. okay. I'll, uh,